And in order for us to get to that place of greater things, something different has to happen. And I want to explain that. You might say, well, why does something different have to happen? The reality is this. If you keep doing what you've always done, you'll keep getting what you've always gotten. Okay? That is a reality. It is, it, it's not a, a, a church reality. It's a life reality. If you keep doing the things that you've been doing, you're going to continue to get the same results that you've been getting. And so if you want to come to a place where you get to greater things, you have to be willing to, uh, to, to say, okay, I'm going to do something different. I'm going to change the equation in some way. So to think that we can accomplish greater things by doing the same things that we've always done would be the equivalent of the, the culturally popular definition of insanity. Okay? I'm just being real with you. If we think we're going to go from where we are now to greater things without something different happening, then we are, we're, we're just insane. I love that, that statement that, 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 you know, and, and it's been attributed to Einstein, it's been attributed to Ben Franklin and others, but the, the definition of sanity, insanity is doing the same thing over and over, expecting different results. I just want you to know that Einstein did not say that. Ben Franklin did not say that. Mark Twain did not say that. That's something that came out of the Narcotics Anonymous group in 1981. (laughs) Next time you hear somebody say that, say, hey, did you know that that came out of a little circle of, of people that were trying to get clean? But our victories of today, and Ray, I was thinking about this. This is something that just came this morning as I was going over my message. The victories of today were built on the commitments that have already been made in our lives. We're living the, the, the joys, the victories, the things that God is doing right now have been built on the commitments that have already been made. The church is experiencing that benefit right now from the commitments that were made 13 years ago in order to bring us to this place. And so the victories of the future are going to be built on the commitments that you and I make at this season. Okay? We can't live on past commitments if we're going to get to that place of greater things in in what God does through us, then it's going to happen because we make those commitments now and we say, okay, God, I'm in. I want to be a part of those greater things. So in order for us to accomplish greater things, something else has to happen in our lives. This morning, the title of my message is Greater Engagement. I believe that greater engagement needs to take place in our lives if greater things are going to incur, occur. And that word engagement, I love that word engagement. And, and, and 13 years ago when I did that series, Engage the Vision, I loved the word engage. And the word engage and engagement, there's a little bit of a different meaning. And so I, 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 I spent some time looking at that definition, and that, that definition, I think, is really something that's going to help us today. And the, 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 what I want to look at, and, and we'll break this down in just a moment, but there's three parts to it. And the first part of, of the, the meaning of the word engagement is in emotional involvement or commitment. The second definition is a state of being in gear, The third definition is hostile encounters between military forces. And this morning I want to use a story that the Lord has been laying on my heart for the last several weeks about today. And I want to take that story and I want to apply it 
to this definition. And so the story will be our, our backdrop. And the story is from Judges chapter 6, 7, and 8. If you want to go home and read that this week, it will give you really a, a complete um, a description of the story, a complete backdrop. But for today, I'm just going to tell that story to you. It's about a man named Gideon. And Gideon was a man that God called to greater things. But I want you to see some things about Gideon that I I think will be refreshing to you. You see, when we first begin reading about Gideon, Gideon is not in a palace. He's not in a a tank. Um, He's not in charge of an army. He's, He's not in a position of authority. Gideon is in a wine press. And a wine press is simply a large a large vat where grapes would be would be compressed and turned into wine. And Gideon is not making wine. This week we had some guests in our building that saw what we were doing and they asked if we were making an, a wine bar. I said we're not that kind of church. <laughs> We even use grape juice for communion. He was in this in this this uh, this wine press. This I imagine it as a a large wooden slatted uh, vat with with some sort of a, a a steel rim around it holding it together. And he was in there, but he wasn't making wine. He was in there threshing wheat. Now the 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 thing about threshing wheat is the wine vat would be the absolute worst place to thresh wheat. Because threshing wheat would be that you take the stalks of grain, head and and stalk all together, and lay it in a pile, and you would take a a pitchfork and you would throw it up into the air. The wind would blow the chaff away from the head of grain. You needed wind. You needed a place where the wind could get at it and really do the work for you. But we see that Gideon is in a place that would be the worst place on earth to do this. And there was a reason. You see, Israel was under attack from the Midianites. In fact, the Midianites would come in and they would destroy everything. Israel would plant crops. They would come in. Midian would ride in. They would destroy the crops even after they were planted. They would come in at harvest time if there was anything to harvest. And they would steal that harvest. They would destroy everything. And so Gideon was hiding from the Midianites. He was trying to, uh, to, to get this grain harvest in. He was afraid of what they were going to do to him because they were stealing and destroying everything, all of their resources in his home territory. So God tells Gideon, he said, I've chosen you to lead an army to defeat this invading enemy. Now, I don't know about you, but if God appeared to me and said that to me, just my personality, I wouldn't think about what it meant. I would just be excited, you know. I I don't know why, that's just me. Gideon was not excited. In fact, Gideon was the exact opposite of excited. Gideon told God lots of reasons why God must have the wrong guy. Have you ever told God that he had the wrong person? Usually it's when God asks us to do something that's outside of our comfort zone. We say, God, you must have the wrong guy because this is not how I operate. This isn't, remember that deal, God, that we had that said, I'll serve you, and, and, but don't ask me to you know, do X, Y, and Z. This is outside of that. Gideon was saying, God, you have the wrong guy for this thing. For this, this job that you want to have done, you've got, in fact, he, he reminds God, God, do you realize that, um, that I come from uh, the, 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 the smallest clan, the weakest clan in all of Israel? That's my clan. In fact, I'm the least of my family in that clan. What he was telling God is I am nothing. 
I am nothing. Some, uh, some, some of the, the, the theologians that have written on this, they, they said that it could have been that when he said he was the least of his family, it could mean one of two things. One, it could mean that he's the youngest, okay? Anybody here the youngest? You know, that can really work in a lot of things, you know. Mom says, hey, do this, and why, well, you know. And being the youngest, sometimes it really works that you get out of those things. But, but I don't know exactly if that's what Gideon was saying. Some people believe that, that it was that all of his brothers had already died in conflict against the Midianites. God, I'm, I'm the least. I'm, I'm the, the least of my family. I am, I, I, I am nothing. I don't have the ability to do what you're asking me to do. But God tells Gideon, he said, I've chosen you to lead this army and I've chosen you to defeat the enemy. So Gideon goes out and he's given the responsibility of, of, of recruiting an army. And he is able to recruit an army of 32,000. Now that's a pretty good army. The only problem was the Midianites numbered 135,000. So do a little multiplication or division, whichever you prefer. But we're talking of more than a 4 to 1 ratio. And I don't like those odds. But that, that was it. Now, I want you to think, God has just called you to lead an army. You have 32,000, and he and the enemy has 135,000. You're thinking, A, can't be done. B, we're toast. And God says to Gideon, Gideon, you have too big of an army. We're already, it's already impossible. You've got too big of an army. So here's, Gideon, here's what I want you to do. I want you to tell these guys that you've you've drafted them, you've recruited them. I want you to tell them that if any of them are afraid, they can go home. Okay? What do you think? You think maybe 10% would go home? 22,000 of the 32,000 said, sayonara. (laughs) We're gone. We're out of here. This is not for us. And, and can you imagine Gideon just literally, the, the, the devastation to his spirit, okay? You're already thinking there's no way. God's gonna have to do it all. Even with 32,000, now we have 10,000. I, I can't imagine his attitude. And then God does something that only God can do. God says, Gideon, you still have too many guys that's it lord i i can't do this i can't that's exactly what god was driving at so god says i want you to take them down to the water okay and tell them to get a drink out of the river and and if they get down in their their hands all fours on hands and, and knees and they just get right their face right down in the water those are not our guys okay why? I have no idea. But if they, if they just reach down and they, they grab a handful of water and bring it up to their mouth, those are the guys that we're going to keep, okay? And, and I'm telling you, Gideon, I, I can only imagine, he's like, I want every guy to drink just like this. <laughs> 300 guys he wound up with. Now God says, now that's a number I can use. You see, God wanted the glory, and he couldn't get the glory with 32,000. He couldn't even get the glory that he wanted on 10,000, and it's not because God is an egomaniac. It's just that when he moves, he wants to move in such a way that we know only he could do it. 300 men. Can you imagine how Gideon felt God knew that Gideon was afraid. God said, okay, Gideon, you're afraid. I'm gonna gonna tell you what to do. I want you to sneak down tonight into the camp of the Midianites. 135,000, I want you to sneak into their camp tonight. And And he goes down, he takes one of his guys, and they go down in the middle of the night, and they sneak into that camp. 
and they get next to one of the tents and they hear two of the soldiers in that tent talking. One of the soldiers says to the other one, I had a dream last night, and in my dream, I saw a loaf of barley bread rolling down the hill and destroying all of our tents. And I know what that dream means. That dream means that Gideon is going to destroy us. Can you imagine the excitement in Gideon's heart? Middle of the night still goes back to his camp, goes back to his measly 300 guys and says, all right, boys, get up because we're going to defeat the enemy tonight. That's faith. He does what any good general would do. He starts handing out the, uh, the armory stuff, right? He's going to hand out the weapons, okay? What would you want in that sort of a fight? I'd want the biggest weapons that I possibly could get. And so Gideon starts to hand them out, and he hands out the same thing to every guy, all 300 guys. A trumpet? That's right, a trumpet, a clay jar, and a torch. That is not what I would want. If I were one of these 300 guys, I would say, why didn't I drink the other way? <laughs> Hands them out, divides them up into three groups, and says, uh, we're going to surround the camp. 135,000. Do you realize how big of a camping space 135,000 people would take up? even in a military fashion, and now you're going to, I can imagine now we're not even 300, we're just 100, and now we got to spread out? Okay, guys, kind of spread, you know, it's like kindergartners, getting them in a line, you know? It's a spread out, everybody, spread out. And Gideon told them, when you hear me, when I give the signal, I want you, this is military genius, blow on your horn. I want you to take a deep breath and I want you to just blow that horn as loud as you can. You're thinking, then what? Gideon says, then what I want you to do is that your clay pot is going to be over your torch and I want you to break that clay pot, that clay jar, I want you to break it exposing the torch and so when Gideon gave the signal everybody blew on their trumpet and then simultaneously they broke those pot those clay pots revealing their torches and the Bible says in Joshua 6 7 and 8 that the confusion was so incredible that the Midians turned on each other and in the initial battle, there was over 100,000 that they just killed themselves. Okay? That's how God works. The enemy just turned on himself and started killing themselves. And then when they finally realized what was happening, they decided to flee because now their, their, their numbers have been devastated and, and, and Gideon was able to pursue them and, and they were able to literally destroy all 135,000 of the Midianite enemies. God won an incredible victory that day. He used Gideon to do it. And what I want to do is take this definition of engagement quick. And I want to apply it to Gideon's story. Engagement definition number one. Emotional involvement or commitment. When God calls you to greater things... You're going to be required to make an emotional commitment. When God called Gideon, Gideon did not want to accept that call to greater things. He was doing just fine, hiding from the enemy in fear, just scratching out an existence. But the angel of the Lord addresses Gideon as mighty warrior. He's hiding in a wine press. He's afraid. And he's totally content. When God calls you to greater engagement, he's going to call you to make a commitment that's beyond your fear. 
God called Gideon to that type of, a, of an engagement. God reminded him, hey, you remember I'm the guy that brought you out of Egypt? He said, yeah, you might have brought us out of Egypt, but you've abandoned us here. The fact that you brought us out of Egypt, the past victories that you won, that's not doing me any good. Remember I said that that past the the victories that we experience now were the commitments of the past that did it. He that was ancient history. That's not doing us any good. We need victory right here and right now. Gideon wasn't too happy about that. God kept insisting that you're going you're gonna to be the guy that's going to lead him. He said, I'm the weakest, I'm the least. My family's the weakest, my family's the least. He was literally from what was called the half-tribe of Manasseh. They weren't even a full tribe of Israel. He said, I can't do it. God kept insisting that he would. And Gideon said, okay, God, if, if, if you're going to do this, I need some sort of a confirmation from you. We call it putting out a fleece. And that was his request of God, and God kept answering those confirmations. The Bible talks about one of Jesus' well-known followers. He's a a, a real well-known doubter in Scripture, and we call him doubting what? Thomas. And after Jesus' resurrection, he appeared to the disciples, but Thomas wasn't part of that. And Thomas said this. Thomas said, unless I can touch the nail prints in his hand, and unless I can thrust my hand into the scar on his side, I will not believe. Everybody else had seen it. He had to touch it to believe it. Not just hearing it secondhand from someone else. The next time Jesus appeared to his followers, when Thomas was there, Jesus said, Thomas, touch my hands. Touch my side. And Thomas said, my Lord and my God. Jesus said, Thomas, you believe because you see. But then he said, blessed are those who believe even though they have not seen. You know that God's blessing is attached to those who will believe him even when they can't see it. That's exactly what we're talking about as a church. You can't see it. I don't know how it will ever happen. When we have faith, when we believe, even though we can't see it, there is a blessing that God attaches to that. When we dare to believe God's calling, we're going to face fear, we're going to face doubt the way Gideon did. We, we're, we, we may not see how it's possible for God to use us. We may say, we're too few, we're too little, we don't have enough resources. But God's blessing is released when we believe before we see the evidence. Scripture says that the very essence of faith is the assurance of what we do not see. That's what we need. We will not be empowered to accomplish greater things unless We believe, and we must commit ourselves emotionally no matter what others will think. And I don't believe that God wants us to scratch out an existence as a church. I believe he's calling us to greater things because of his plan for us. Engagement number two. It's the state of being in gear. I love this. When God calls us to greater things, there's always going to be a point when we're required to get in gear. I'm reminded of driving a school bus when I was in college. It was a great job. It was my last year of Bible college. I would drive in the morning, go to school, then I would drive in the afternoon. My afternoon bus uh, was not a very good bus, uh, and, and it was really hard to shift. And I used to drive on 694 rush hour traffic, stop and go traffic, okay? And this bus, I, and we, we had to double clutch, and, and this bus, when you would go from the neutral position into gear, it would vibrate so hard that my hand would go numb. Okay? And then there was always that final clunk. Some of you drive cars that you hear that clunk, and it's not a good clunk, right? And, and that, but unless I got that clunk, unless I got it in gear, I could not go anywhere The same thing was true for Gideon. There was a point 
when Gideon had to put it into gear in order for God to bring about the victory that he did. And I want you to know that that same thing applies for us. In order for God to bring about the victory that he has promised, we've got to get it into gear. We've got to take that step of activating our faith. James 2.22, speaking of Abraham, we talked about this uh, last week. You see that his faith and his actions were working together and his faith was made complete by what he did. It's not enough for us to simply say that we believe God when it comes to greater things. As we step out and put our faith into action, we might hear the gears grind just a little bit. And it's embarrassing when you're on 694 in stop and go traffic and you're shifting that bus and all people hear is, they smile at you. If you can't find them, grind them. That's what they say. Clunk, take off. You might feel a little bit like that. You're on the highway of life and you're, you're trying to shift your faith into gear and it might sound a little noisy. But there's a point we've got to drop it into gear and pop the clutch and start moving on to greater things. I believe that's what God is calling us to. Engagement number th- definition number three. A hostile encounter between military forces. How many of you know the enemy doesn't like it when we begin to act in faith? He doesn't like it. When God calls us to greater things and we accept that call, the enemy is not going to like it. The 135,000 troops were intimidating to Gideon. Even if he had 32,000 men, it was still in, in, intimidating. The, the, the 100 or the 300, that's ridiculous. They were operating solely on faith. There was nothing else other than the promise of God. They were, his people were impoverished. They had cried out to the Lord. The enemy had taken everything from them, leaving nothing from Israel. And God called Gideon to confront the enemy. When God calls us to greater things, I will guarantee you that you will confront the enemy in your life because he's coming after you. Because you have made a decision to start stepping out in faith. Whatever we do in our lives, when we step out in faith, the enemy is going to be right there. And he's going to want to nail you right between the eyes and say, what business do you have against all my troops? You are nothing. You've even said it yourself. You are the least. You are the weakest. What business do you have? I guarantee you, you will face this moment when you take out that greater things commitment card. And you say, okay, God, what are you calling me to do in faith? And you put that number down. If that number is a number of faith, I guarantee you, you are going to face the enemy's attack and he is going to say, what business do you have putting that number down? And he's going to bring every force of hell against you. He is going to bring fear against you. He is going to bring doubt against you. Every hostile enemy that's out there, it's going to come literally against you. But Gideon, on his scouting mission, when he heard the dream, it did something to him. It put faith in his heart. And he knew what God had said to him. And now God had let him see into the mindset of the enemy. Friends, the mindset of the enemy it is to lie, to steal, to kill and destroy. The enemy is defeated, but he wants to come across as someone who's going to be victorious. But he's only going to win if we let him win. Ephesians 6.12, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, against the powers of this dark world, against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Friends, Satan does not want God's church to win. 
and he's going to bring everything he has. And it's not just against the church as a corporate body, but if you're stepping out in faith as a part of the church and that individual, he's going to bring it against you. That's what's going to happen. But the scripture says that with God on our side, one can put a thousand to flight and two ten thousand. I want to end with a quick story of a young man named Kyle. Kyle was born with a congenital amputation disease. He was born with no arms or legs. And growing up as a kid, Kyle wanted to do one thing. Kyle wanted to be a wrestler. And so Kyle went out for the wrestling team. And as you can imagine, it was pretty uncomfortable. And Kyle lost his first match. Kyle lost his second match. Kyle lost 35 wrestling matches in a row. Now that can be devastating. Kyle begged his parents, please, let me quit. I just can't handle it. And his parents, through encouragement, they, 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 they got him to keep going. And something happened on that 36th match. Kyle pinned the other guy. Not once, not twice, but he pinned him five times. And the match was called on what's called the mercy rule. Something happened that day in Kyle. Kyle had been told his whole life, his whole wrestling career anyway, a guy with no arms or legs can, can win a wrestling match. But, and he believed it, but now something had happened in his mind and he knew he could win. And so he continued to wrestle. That next year, Kyle went undefeated. In fact, Kyle won 135 consecutive wrestling matches and went to nationals and placed 12th in the country. Think about that mindset. Kyle said it, it had nothing to do with the physical side of things. But for a long time, I bought into the belief of other people telling me that I'll never win a match, so I didn't. Something needs to happen in us. Because, you see, the world is going to tell us that the church is irrelevant for today. The church is going to tell us, what business do you have? The enemy is going to say, you, you can't support this. You can't be a part of this. You have no resources. Look at you. They're dead. You've got nothing. But God is calling us to greater things. We're going to have to make a commitment. We're going to have to get it into gear, even if it makes a little noise on the downshift. We're going to have to do it, and we're going to encounter hostile enemies, the enemy of our soul, and he is out to steal, kill, and destroy. But God has spoken, and when God speaks, a spirit of faith arises. Would you stand with me? Father, I thank you for this pivotal moment. I thank you for the, the way Gideon shows us an example of someone that was up against insurmountable odds. I thank you for that challenge. I thank you for the call that you've placed on us as a body of believers, as Silver Creek Church. I thank you, Lord, for the the commitments that were made in the past out on M28, the commitments that this church made to build that building and the addition and then in 2005 to do it again here, to come to this location. And now as we go through this process again, Father, I pray that your, your spirit will be faithful and speak to our hearts that we might stand in faith. Father, I believe that you want to do great things. 
I believe that you've called us to greater things. And so we want to make that commitment today. 